Hi, yeah. I'm Frida Weisel. I'm a tour guide in Hasidic Brooklyn, New York. And today I'm going to be talking to Elena Solomon about a very special type of textile art that is part of Hasidic garments. And it's called the art itself. The um, technique we're going to talk about is called Chpanya Arbit. Um, so hi, Elena. Thank you for... I'm so excited to talk to you about this. Um, can you start by introducing yourself to the viewers? Sure. Um, my name is uh, Elena. I'm, uh, I have a master's in art history and curatorial studies. Uh, and I just finished, I just spent the year um, doing the master's and writing my thesis uh, on the effects of immigration on Eastern European Jewish handcraft uh, when they came to the U.S. from Eastern Europe. Um, and so part of what brings me here today is uh, my interest in the Spanier Arbit, uh, which was also part of the general Eastern European Jewish uh, craft world. Um, I'm also a student of Yiddish and um, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I, this is the first I, I... I just learned about you being a student of Yiddish. So this is all ties it in, in together beautifully. Um, so I want to talk about the Spanier Arbit that we saw on the At Atura, uh, which is a part of the men's talus prayer shawl garment. Um, and I, before I spoke to you, I had no idea about, um, you know, that Torah was just part of the landscape of the Hasidic um, men's clothing. So I, uh, it piqued my interest. I was doing a recording of a, uh, all the shopping items that are available in Williamsburg and I looked at that too. So I'm going to show you some footage of that. So the viewers get to see what we are talking about. And then I'm going to turn it over to you to explain what we saw and what we didn't and uh, what the story behind it is. So, uh, Here goes my very bad video editing. <laughs> this is beautiful. It goes on. There's no talus here. It goes on the men's the men's talus that the men wear to pray. <laughs> Are they? I want to see ones that are made by hand. This is made by hand. So what? Which video is it? And thank you, thank you. I respect oh my. How much? This is three thousand dollars a piece, and it's real silver threads. It's sewn by hand. Who buys this? Grooms, actually. Rich people, obviously. I don't like this style. I don't think it's nice. This is the same as this. Yeah. This is the nice one. Yeah. So only this is handmade. So it's handmade. three weeks to make it. And this also in Germany? I don't know. Wow. Nice. Okay. What did you think? Um. So, I mean, it's, it's so, so gorgeous to see. Uh, and I'm glad that you showed the machine made and the handmade together. Um, I was gonna, I was gonna point out the machine made right away. Um, and then you identified it. And, and I think they're, to a trained eye, the difference is clear, but to an untrained eye, they're quite similar, which is very interesting. A lot of machine made um, crafts, uh, besides knitting, it's very easy to tell which one is machine and which one is not machine. I couldn't uh, tell. They they told me I couldn't tell. It, right. The the handmade doesn't necessarily look handmade to me. Maybe the well, colorful it's one. Very good. What I'm the, it, the handmade is very high quality, and the, the machine made is a is a good attempt, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. It's not that the handmade like 
like the handmade does its own thing and the machine made is a really good imitation uh which is which is just very interesting yeah that they are going to the great length of making the machine imitate the hand what what's been done by hand yes and also the nature of the craft because some crafts for example crocheting um you cannot make it by machine it just doesn't the machines won't do it uh-huh there's no mechanism. knitting it's much easier because the you can kind of throw the threads in between each other and so it's much easier to make a um, imitation and so um, even practice knitters can't always tell that something is machine or handmade so it's less about um how good the machines are and just like about also about the nature of the craft gotcha Gotcha, that, that you can replicate. So let's talk about the craft. Let's talk about what what this, what what did they make there? What do they do with, with that tutor the, that they design it this way? And how is it unique to the Jewish story? Yeah, the Spanier Arbit, and I should preface this, I forgot to mention in my intro. Uh, I'm writing, my colleague Lily Homer, who couldn't be here today, we're writing uh, an encyclopedia entry for an upcoming uh, encyclopedia in the, it was called the Bloomsbury Encyclopedia on textiles. Um, this is gonna be the edition on non-wovens. And so we are writing the, some historical documentation and we're reaching out to everyone that we can to try to get more information uh, than we already know. So I hope that your viewers take that into consideration and feel, feel free to reach out to us with whatever they have. Um, so, but what we do know now, um, the Spanier Arbit is very fascinating uh, as a craft because it's the only craft specific to Ashkenazi jewelry, like ever. You know, all the other crafts we share with many cultures, um, you know, embroidery, knitting, sewing, uh, you know, many people do that, but nobody does Spanier Arbit except us except the Ashkenazi um, Jews. And so the other interesting thing about this craft um, is that it has an origin story. And most crafts don't, it's very hard to, you know, there's not an individual person. It starts slowly over time. This craft has a specific man at a specific point in time who, has, who it suddenly starts. And this is a big myth, um, of course, because that's not how craft starts. And I'll explain the story and then I'll explain more of what we found out about why, um, where the holes are. Uh, okay, so this man it was named Mordechai Leib Margulis. Um, he was working in, actually just outside the Pale of Settlement in Eastern Europe in the mid-1800s to late 1800s. Uh, or maybe, sorry, I think he was born in the 1830s and then he worked um, into the 19th, into the 20th century. So the story goes, he escaped the Hoppers in Berdyshev, uh, which was on the Russian side. So we're, we're right at the border, right? So the pale is over here um, and you could get, you know. Explain what the Hoppers on. are, just because we go very rudimentary. Yes, yeah, so but the Hoppers were Russian, uh, people in the Russian army and the Russian government who would come and they would take Jews, they would kidnap them, they would hop them, and they would conscript, uh, conscript them. them, and they would, you know, become, they would be forced to take part in non-Jewish activities, um, eat non-kosher meat, uh, work on, on the Sabbath, on Shabbos, um, things like that. And so many Jews, of course, tried to escape the hoppers, and Mordechai um, did so, uh, he jumped the border. He he snuck through. It, people don't know exactly how he did it. I think they, he may have been smuggled on a cart across the border. Um, and so he arrives in a town called Sasov one day, uh, which was in Galicia in, in modern day Ukraine. And he had some silver thread in his pockets from his father's workshop. And so that day, I mean, obviously he shows up, he needs to work, he needs some money. He, he makes um, a loom, a Spanier Arbit loom, and he makes the first uh, atura, or outside of the um, Yiddish-speaking community, we would say atara, in, in Sasso, the first uh, atura in Sasso. And this is according to an author, Giza Frankel. So, and, so this is the origin story, and like quickly he gets 20 workers, um, 
you know, and it becomes, he actually creates a, a monopoly on the whole production of aturas for, for quite a while, several decades. Um, and so he's credited, he, I think the origin story is attributed to him because he had a, such a hold on the market for quite a while. Um, but it became very popular at the time and he was kind of running things. So, you know, and part, part of what he did was he really emphasized um, the holiness of the craft and, and many of the, Sasov as a town in Galicia or Ukraine became known um, for making aturas and, uh, you know, it was very holy and it was very important to many people in the town and there were many different roles and I'll get into that. Um, now the obvious problem with this origin story is how did Mordechai know how to make the Atura that first day? Why does he have silver thread in his pocket? You know, where did he get it? How did he know, how did he know to make a loom? How, it just like, that kind of thing doesn't really suddenly happen, right? So if you dig a little bit further, there's um, some references, some of the, there's a few scholars who are writing, who have written about um, Spanier Arbit. Um, and they reference two towns, Berdyshev and Radjavel. Uh, in, I think they're both in Russia. Um, and this was sort of the first, the centers that where it, it initially is believed is the quote, um, to have first appeared around 1700s. Uh, and also there is a woman, for those of your viewers who are in New York or in the New York area, um, Bonnie Dara Michaels is the curator at the Yeshiva University Museum, and she wrote an article on Shabana Arbit, and they also have um, examples of uh, very beautiful ones and very specific ones that you can go to the uh, museum and ask to see. I haven't been there yet. I'd really love to go, but she's, she's quite nice. So um, one, of the, uh, one of the scholars, Ita Aber, she's Israeli, um, she also mentions Berdyshev and Rajavel, uh, and she cites them as like, why, why there in Europe? And that, that why, she says that because it was part of a path outward from Spain. Um, and so that supposedly this, this braided lace originated um, in Spain, and then when people left, uh, you know, they took it with them. But, th and so that's because- So that's the that's the word Spanier. Right, because there's a myth, the Spanier, there's two, right, there's two origin stories. One is um, tied to this Mordechai Margulis, right, that it, and then it started in Eastern Europe, and the other is that it's a, um, like it's, and it's spun work, and the other is that it's Spanish lace, Spanish work. And the, I think that the connection to Spain is an accident, um, because the countries that people went to after the Inquisition were, Italy, England, Holland, Morocco, Egypt, France, and the Americas, but not Eastern Europe. So any connection to Spain, and there were no, there were no other braided laces in Spain at the time, and there weren't, but there were like some similar examples and things uh, happening in Eastern Europe, you know, at the time in the 1800s, not in the early 1500s or late 1400s, um, and there was also like the popularity of the silver thread, metal thread. Which was, and so, which also coincided with the time and place that. Right, so a lot of the cultural context that probably created Spanier Arvid um, matches, right? The, the metal thread, which was coming in from Germany and that was becoming popular, um, braided lace. There are se several other forms that we're also looking into for possible background. That was happening in the area in the area uh, that, that, for instance, Bardechev or Sasov, the, the European regions from where, where we originally see that Tuta, that work on that Tuta. Yeah, I'm, so I'm not sure exactly in those regions, definitely in Europe. Gotcha. Not mm -hmm. necessarily Spain. I, I think the Spanier, like, to me, Spanier Arbit is the Yiddish word weaving, right? Or, or spun, right? Fun is the, how it's translated, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, right, so so a lot like, if, 
some of the literature just sort of says, and people will tell you, oh, it, it obviously is Spanish work because that's what it means. Um, but we think that that's not true. Yeah. So we think, um, yeah. Yeah. So we think it, it, the entire story of this one brave individual that sneaks away and has this terrifically successful, um, like secret family sauce um, that, that, it looks like a lot like a, a a myth just because it's not usually how how craft art evolves right exactly yeah like a cult of personality probably or because he yeah. had a monopoly yeah um now we we do know um that in Berdyshev, like Jews appeared around 1721 and like this became the center of Jewish life in the pale um a lot of the, like, the, uh, oh, I'm blanking on the word, the Maskilim and the Haskola started there, um, a lot of Hasidism also started there, there were centers of trade, including tailoring, which makes sense that, you know, if, if Spanier Arbit started there, there were a lot of tailors and, like, very, a lot of experts with uh, textiles and cloth. Uh, and so it makes, you know, it makes sense that, oh, I'm sorry, Rajaval, there's no evidence of a town called Rajaval. I couldn't, I couldn't, find, I shouldn't say there's no evidence. I couldn't find any personally, um, but there was a monopoly of cloth uh, given to seven Jewish merchants in Berdyshev by a Prince Rajaval in 1797. So I think this reference to Rajaval and Berdyshev comes from this like, very specific locus in which Berdyshev was the town, probably where it started, even though it's famously con uh, connected to Sasso. Mm -hmm. And this prince gave a monopoly of trade, which may have birthed, you know, this, that's all we know right now. Yeah, so, so it all spins out like that. And so probably Mordechai, uh, Spanier Robert was already happening in Berdyshev at the time in the late 1700s. And he probably grew up knowing some of it. And also that's probably where he got the silver thread and why he had it. And so, then he becomes very accomplished when he go when he escapes and goes to Sasov and be, you know, and makes the name for the tourists. I see. Yeah. So um, can we talk about what the craft involves? Yes. Um, so some of this. I, don't, I only know a little bit, and the, uh, many, the makers at the moment, we, we think that there are only five in the world left who do it by hand. Um, of, of course, as you saw, it's easier and cheaper to get it by machine. Uh, and, you know, there's, I think it takes a long time uh, to learn, and it's also very holy, and so this is done by men, and so you know, as a woman, I have a more limited understanding of how it might work. So, um, but essentially there's a drum. Maybe I can find one picture. Um, I didn't have that pulled up for you. I just have a picture of what um, certain things about the atuitas look like. Well, you can, you can show us up close what the, what the, what the Spania Arbit looks like, but you can also show us the, the, machines it's made on. It's really interesting because usually this is the kind of thing that's done by by women, um, this kind of place. Okay. Uh, um, you know, I heard a very interesting story from Nomi Seidman who studied Sarah Chenier. She told me that, um, uh, th that so I don't know if you can see me. I, I, I want you to be the, the star, <laughs> but I don't know how to record this correctly. Um, but anyway, um, I spoke to Nomi Seidman who studied Sarah Chenier and she told me that Sarah Chenier did lace collars by hand for her students as a way to sort of protest the modernization of clothing to machines, you know, to, to preserve this womanly, instead of the male manager and the women working in the big factory, it was a female space, the working on the lace um, handwork. So um, the move to machines was a move away from the female space to a male managed space. And Sarah Schneer 
Yeah, it, that's fascinating to me. And and Sarah Schneer protested that by sewing her students. She she was the mother of the Beis Yaakov Girls School movement, and she protested the modernization by by making lace collars for her students, um, which they wore. Which which strikes me. It makes sense. It's women and 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 work. You know, when I grew up, my mother made a gartel for the boys you know seeing her knit the gartel is such a strong association of, of womanhood to me um yeah i'm curious i think just because i make my own lace so I, I really understand the reason why she chose to do that do you know what kind of lace she did so you can look at the pictures of the base yako project um and I've looked at them because I was curious and it's like a, a lace collar that you seem to put on top of a shirt. Like if you have a shirt and it, you sort of dress it up in the way you might dress up with, with a scarf or a dick. So it seems you, you attach it to your outfit and it, it looks like I would say a children's collar, you know? I, I think it also has some of the technique of a Stefania Arbit in the sense that you take threads and you expand on them and make them into something bigger by, by, you know more about lace than me. <laughs> well, I, I, I was curious if it was crocheted or some other kind, but if you don't know that. Oh, uh, no, no. You look at it and you'll tell me. I'm completely, I know nothing. I know nothing. Um, do, you have, do you have the, I, I want to see the bobbin that you make, you know, the the the, the machine you made the Spanier Arbit on, though. I have, I have it. it. I can pull it up. Okay. One moment. Okay, so this is on the YIVO website, um, and you can see on the left here, wow. this is, yeah, um, so it's this drum, and then you have the bobbins hanging here, so it's sort of like bobbin lace is like the immediate connection, um, which was known to the Eastern European Jewish community at the time, um, although we're my colleague and I are debating as to whether the stems from Bob and Lace or not. Uh, but anyway, the, if this is as far as I know, I don't know the specific technique, but there is um, a wool or something um, inside and the metal threads are wrapped around it. And when we go back to the um, images of the actual pieces, I'll show you that, you know, you can see these coils and that they're wrapped around something. Can you scroll up? We see part of uh, a Natura on the, yeah, that, is this it? Yes. No, I have a, I'll show you a different picture closer up. This is, this is actually an interesting, unique piece um, because it's a little, a lot more lace. Yeah. We can get closer because um, the way you tell the, the way that lace is defined is by the negative space, meaning the space, the gaps. The space where there isn't anything, and and uh, Spanier Arbit has a lot fewer negative space, and this has quite a lot, um, you know. And you can see this mesh in the middle. That's not typical of Spanier Arbit. Um, this these rings on the outside are, uh, and and these swirls on the inside are definitely Spanier Arbit. And you can see, I don't know if you can see this ridge here, like that it's wrapped around something. It's three dimensional, yeah, uh, which is really a um, a distinction of this craft. Um, and then this mesh here is really what makes it stand out. And this is at the Yeshiva University Museum. I'd really, I've been dying to see this piece. It was made a lot later um, among the ones that are talked about in the written literature. This was in, um, yeah, the, the, I think it, well into the 1900s, I know that. Wow. Uh, okay, I'll share, I'll share yeah. a different photo with you. I can see the, the, the large coil. It looks very similar to what I saw, especially the machine made has a lot of large coil, right? Oh, wow. Yeah, they both, right. So they'll both have that. Do you see the red photo? Is that what you're looking at? I'm looking at a, at a I don't know, is that a Natura? On a red background. <laughs> yes. Yeah, this yeah. is a Natura. Um, this is- uh, There's no negative space here. That's correct. Yeah, there's uh, there's almost nothing. I, I think nothing. And so um, you can see there are different styles. So I'll talk a little bit about about the parts of it. 
Um, so the there's a main section and you can see there's a border here and then there's the main section. And the main section is called a Spiegel, um, I think because it's symmetrical. And- uh, Spiegel mirror. Spiegel mirror. And the outside um, kasten or, or box, um, there's always a border framing it. Um, and so that's the, that's the general, like most pieces will have this format and then within there's gonna be a lot of variety. Um, and, and the motifs are a big part of what you notice when you first see it. So here we can see these rosettes um, and then these scales uh, that are making this S shape. Um, and the scales are called liske and they're pretty common. You know, I think they're very natural to the craft. Um, so, and Sasov became known for like quite a number of motifs. Uh, I will tell you. Um, Herzola hearts, um, drei Schlangen, three snakes. Is, isn't Eagle. this drei Schlangen? This looks like three uh, snakes. You know what? These are the drei Schlangen, yeah. <laughs> Very good. Um, Oigale, which are, you know, eyes. And I don't, I don't know, like, I, I know the terms and I don't actually necessarily know which corresponds to which. Um, Blethel, which are leaves, and Keppel, um, heads, like, I, I'm not sure how those are, how those look like. Um, there are other motifs that people will make. Liske, which we can see on the border. Um, the rosettes, like, here. There are people will also make stars, um, menorahs, mug and davids. And there used to be the, the real fascinating thing in which there is somewhat limited information is that people used to use the turas to communicate with each other. So um, it was like a symbol of, especially for um, Hasids, which Hasidic group that you were among. So for example, um, Bell's Hasids would wear the Kapel motif. Uh -huh. And, you know, which, which I just is cool to think about that people would, you know, wear that and, and you would know things about them. Um, Kamarno Hasids would wear Liske and Zionists would wear Mogan Uh-huh, of course. You know, so, you, you know, you could always, you could see someone and you could know what they think about, you know, things. Wow. It's, it's yeah. eternal. It's the eternal story of Hasidim. The clothing uh, has always been such a big part of signifying. That's right. But but that's that tuta per se, not necessarily other garments, right? There were other garments that people were wearing with this crap. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, right. I don't I don't know if it at the women's garments. I'm not sure. I, I imagine that it did apply. Um, I don't know. And I, I am curious for any of your viewers who know if people still use the symbols to communicate now. Or if people just buy beautiful things because it's a beautiful craft and you know that's what they want to buy. Uh, let me share a new photo. Okay, so here's another one. So there, are, in, in addition to aturas, people used to make different kinds of things. So for example, um, there were, I don't know why in the article they call them skull caps. I think these were kippas uh, produced in Sasab. And this is in, these are not in the U.S. These are in the um, this is in Krakow in Poland. Um, there were also uh, what they're calling here women's caps, um, and you can see it's it's a little hard to see too much detail. Um, of course, that typical uh, like the kasten you know doesn't apply to a cap, um, and like how symmetrical is the cap? It's hard to tell from here. Um, is there is there a spiegel also? Like we don't know. Uh, right. And then they had these um, prustofis, which women would wear for modesty. They would it would cover the chest, you know, the breast really. Uh, and I think you could more closely mirror the 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 box and sym symmetry of the atura on the brustaka, and you can you know you can see the symmetry a little bit here. The picture is not great. Yeah, yeah, uh, I see it. Right. I wonder what that would look like in an outfit. Would, would it be like a line coming all the way down the shirt? So let's see, I have an article here. So it was worn by women over their breasts 
Um, so, you know, and it doesn't say, it doesn't say how it was tucked in. Like I imagine it may, that that bottom section was probably tucked into a skirt that you would wrap around, but it, it's hard to say. I would imagine I it, it, it looks like bottom. it has a neck space and then the bottom, right. yeah. And it looks like the kind of length that would go the full shirt. Length. Yeah, and I think it would cover up buttons like as an additional layer of modesty, but also as something um, beautiful. Yeah, and decorative. Right. I wonder, I have no idea if um, there's a, a garment of clothing that uh, um, Hasidische Rebbesche women from, from royal dynasties, that they, they wear called uh, Stedentichel, which I think is, is a kind of intricate artwork on, on, the, on the head covering, which I never looked at closely. And I, I'm wondering about it. I'm sure they're still yeah, producing okay. it. Yeah, it's like it's. It looks like that bonnet you pictured. It looks like that, but I don't know. I'm. I'm. I guess. Hopefully, people will will respond to this by sharing what they know. Uh, maybe we can even know who makes these. I wouldn't be surprised if, um, you know, when I was at the shop, I asked if non Jews make them, and they said, "What's the difference?" You know, they're they're like it just needs to be produced. <laughs> um, so I wonder who's actually making it. I wouldn't be surprised if it's. Not you. When I was a kid, I remember. Why not? Go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, I remember the embroidery shop would be staffed by girls older than me. And I remember going to buy things in the basement. And a lot of girls would be like Mad Men 1950s. A lot of girls would sit over their sewing machines doing their embroidery, doing hand. And the girls who were talented, you know, they were stars. And now they wouldn't even know if they're talented in that way, you know? That, that kind of craft is not even appreciated. But this is not so long ago that the girls would do it by hand. But now I have no idea. You know, it's it would be interesting if it's even done by by people from the community. The, the Spani well, the Spanier Arbit, I know, we know of two names. There's one person in Jerusalem and there, David Farkas is in, um, connected to like Farkas, uh, Judaica, he's upstate now. We were trying, Lily and I were trying to connect with him. Um, but I know that he makes them by hand. But it could be he has them made by hand. It, it doesn't mean that he makes them. Oh, uh, you think? I think so. Oh. I think so. Like there, there are bakeries. There was a woman I know very well in Williamsburg, Maria, who has been baking for the Hasidic community for 30 years. She's from Venezuela. This kind oh. of arrangement where someone with talent becomes sort of part of that hand, you know, the making uh, takes over certain roles in the community is, is rather common. I, I don't know, you know, it's, I think there is a secrecy to this kind of thing where they, you know, they don't want to give away who's doing it for them because <laughs> they don't right. want the competition to, you know, we can, we can, we can, hopefully people will tell us, hopefully we can find out. Yeah. More. I, I'm intrigued. Yeah, if anyone knows David Farkas or how to get in touch, um, yeah, we'd love to talk. So um, I want to, I want to, I guess, wrap up by hearing what drew you and and Lily, your colleague Lily, um, if you can speak for her, uh, if you or or for yourself, what what drew you to studying this this, and I guess what do you learn in the process? What's it been like? So it's a good question. I was, you know, what did it? Um, so I, the Jewish craft, you know, I mean, I, and I study, I make a lot of craft. I make lace, um, crochet and needle lace. And so I wanted to study it. And I know that many culture, I mean, every culture has a a history of textiles that are specific to that community. And so I was looking into it because I was like, well, what is the Jewish textile? Like what is specific to us? Um, what's our history with textiles and what does it look like? And I, through that search, I discovered Spanier Arbit um, and also many other things that, you know, I ended up writing my thesis about um, that as a diasporic people, we actually end up sharing textiles with wherever, whoever that we're living nearby. So it changes as we move, which is uh, 
was very unexpected to find. It was quite interesting. Um, but the Spanier Arbit stands alone as, as ours, you know, as something that came out of our own community uniquely. And as someone who both makes lace and also um, studies Jewish craft history, you know, that's what pulled me in. Can we see your lace? Yeah, you, I'm making um, my chuppa right now. Do you want to see it? Oh, God, you're getting married. I'm getting married, yes. Ah, so you're, you're making the chuppa itself? Yeah. The canopy? Yeah, yeah. What? Uh, yeah, I want to see it. <laughs> Hold on, I'll tell you one second. Okay, so what I'm doing is, um, in my grandmother's dress is in the other room. So I'm taking my grandmother's wedding dress, I'm taking the skirt, uh, and I, I, I had it removed from the top, and I'm gonna, that's gonna be in the center. And it's this beautiful, um, like, floral lace pattern. I mean, it's machine made, um, but it's this beautiful floral lace. And surrounding it, I, I'm going to have a border of this other um, lace called Tenerife lace, which my uh, fiance's great aunt used to make. I mean, she made all kinds of lace um, all the time. And so I'm taking the lace from my side. My grandma was also, um, she, she just passed away in uh, last August. Oh. Is he going like Racha? Um, and so, so, but I'm, she, and she didn't make the dress, um, but it was like part of her sort of textile heritage. And so I'm taking that from my side and the Tenerife lace, which I learned um, from his side and I'm, bo I'm bordering it and I have this like floral, I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, we can see it now. Is That's it? what you made? Yeah, so I have, I have like a bunch of, oh, I have to make. Oh, wow. They look like doilies uh, to me. Yeah, tiny ones. Yeah, yeah. And I'm gonna, I wish I had some background, hold on. Can we see your, your grandma's dress also? Or it's too much to bring? Yeah, no, it's, it's right in the other room. Oh, you still can't see it. Okay, I'll Put show it on you the what black. On the opposite side of that, there's black. You Put it on black. black? Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, we can okay, see good. it. Wow, so you, those are threads that are coming out like a sun, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, maybe and, I'll send you pictures you can. Um, and it, so it, it's made like this. Like oh. here's the and you like weave it around and then you unpin it. Wow, how many are you making of these? I'm not sure. I think 300. I have to make tons. What? Do yeah, you listen and to like audiobooks cool. or some? Yeah, usually or music. Yeah, or music. Wow. Podcast. Podcast. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get the dress. I can show you that as well. I can send you photos um, after this, which are capture it better than the video. But um, one second. So her dress. Oh wow. Let me see if you can. Wow, that's pretty. So yeah, and so you see the floral and then. Oh yeah. Oh, it's so, both ivory. Correct, yeah, I color matched it. And then the shape also, maybe yeah. you could. Yeah, yeah. It's supposed to mimic the flower a little bit. I see, I see. But the, her flower is like thin, thin threads like in one direction and yours comes out in the sun. True, that's true. Yeah, it's gonna be very pretty. So does the color match with, um, oh, the, you're just making the frame. You're not getting any additional garment of clothing from your fiance's side. You're just using the, the technique. Right. Uh -huh. Oh, that's gonna be pretty. Well, mazel tov. Thank you. When's the wedding? Um, we actually, we're having two because Warren's family, my family's family is in Israel and uh, my family is in Chicago. So um, it's in June and August. I see. You have until then to do 300 <laughs> tiny. 
doily. Yeah, and then I have to make, I have to sew them all together. And yeah, so just, it's, it's enough time, I think. Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. Well, thank you for sharing all of that. It's been really, really interesting. And it, personally, it's wonderful to me to hear um, young people in Jewish academia interested in that kind of, you know, I, I feel like th there's so much that's not explored and it's really enriching and like to sew it into your personal life makes it so much more special. Yeah. Th and thank you so much for hosting me. Um, this was such so fun to talk to you. Yeah. Same here. All right. I'll send you the link.